Welcome, Jason Cohen. Thanks for thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Nice Easy to be here. So Jason is the founder of not one, but two unicorn companies, WP Engine and Smart Bear. Can you, in your own words, tell me what Smart Bear is? Sure. So this is a company I started in 2002. Mm -hmm. and we made peer code review software, meaning software developers that review each other's work, mm -hmm. just like an author and editor would. And for the same reasons, to find bugs, to teach new people how things work, mm -hmm. to work with people who are not co-located and mm -hmm. still talk about code. And nowadays, everybody does that kind of stuff. It's built into tools like GitHub. But back then, it was rare and there were no other tools. And so we were the ones doing code reviews. And you had sold that a long time ago, right? 2007. Okay. And that was your first like giant sale like that? Yeah. Nice. And then um, I think I met you shortly after this when you started WP Engine. What is WP Engine? So we're now the largest managed WordPress platform. Mm -hmm. So WordPress being the way that 43% of the web builds a website, which is an insane number. Yes. <laughs> and even 1% of the whole internet is a big number. Yeah. You know? So WordPress is, is open source software that 43% of the web uses to build their website. And we are the largest managed platform, meaning we handle stuff like security and speed and uptime. And we build tools for the people that make WordPress sites, mm -hmm. um, which we give away for free. Um, so... Yeah, so we have a whole ecosystem of making WordPress sites. So I have spent, I'm assuming, well over $30,000 on your company, on WP Engine. But the funny thing is, and this is something I wanted to ask you before about pricing, is like I think you charge probably 10 times or 20 times more than some of the other WordPress hosts that I've seen in the past. So you could find like $3 a month WordPress hosts. Um, why did you start a company that was that much more expensive? And how did you know that people were willing to pay that yeah. much more. So this is a, a story of, I had the problem. So I, you know, so I fixed it for myself, yeah. but, uh, most of the time those aren't businesses. You've seen a problem, you fix it yourself. And there's various reasons why that's not good enough to actually be a business that can even feed one person. And the reason is you might be right that there's a problem, but maybe not enough people have it. Maybe they have it, but they don't know or they're not willing to pay to solve it. Mm -hmm. It's not one of their top priorities. So they don't, they, they're not willing to allocate the budget for it or spend the time to do something about it. Or maybe it is, but the competitors are better at it mm -hmm. in ways that maybe you didn't work for you, but work for most people. Um, there's a lot of other things besides that. Like, can you charge the right amount? Like you did it for yourself because it was fun, but that doesn't mean it's cost effective mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that you can charge enough to cover, you know? So these are all reasons why I saw the problem. So I, sold it for myself is not often a business, but in this case it was. And the way I found out is I kept calling bloggers and saying, Hey, uh, my blog is crashing. Cause I have a blog about startups. That's 16 years old. Now I have a blog about startups. And when I get on the front page of these link sharing sites, it crashes for the traffic. Mm -hmm. So what do you use to stay up? Yeah. And it was, I don't know, but if you find it, tell me, cause I need that. <laughs> mm. So I turned into customer development as we now call it. But back then, like Lean Startup didn't exist yet. So just to be clear of how long ago this was. So we didn't have names for this, but I started actually interviewing people in a structured way. And I was able to validate and invalidate some hypotheses around this and discovered after 50 customer interviews, five zero, it took four Whoa. months because you know how hard it is to get someone on the phone, yeah. right? Um, I found there is a problem that enough people have and they would pay 10 times more for WordPress hosting if it was fast, Mm -hmm. scalable, which is my problem, mm -hmm. secure. And if you call tech support, answer questions about WordPress specifically, mm -hmm. not just about, well, I don't know, you're connected to the internet and the power's on, so we're done. Yeah. And so those, those people you mentioned that charge $3, they don't do any of those things that yes. we just said. So on the one hand, you get a lot for your money. I mean, for $3 a month, you're on the internet and you can do quite a lot. Like it's actually kind of insane how much you can do for $3. It's, it's a good ROI, mm -hmm. but the instant you say, yeah, but it's important to me that my site is fast. So I rank higher in Google or so that people stick and so forth. Oh, okay. Well, if you want it to be really fast, mm -hmm. then $3 a month isn't going to buy you that. Cause they stuck you on a server with literally thousands of other sites. Uh -huh. That's part of why it's only $3. You're just not gonna have the horsepower to be fast. Or if you get a load of traffic, it's not, it's going to fail because you're in a server with thousands of other people. You're only paying $3. Of course, you're, you're not going to get enough resources to succeed when that happens. So it's a, it's a great ROI, but if you care about these things, ah, well then 
you know, then that's not sufficient. And so the question is, do you want to spend even $30 a month? Which if you care about that, because it's your business or it's some personal site that you care about, then $30 a month still isn't a lot if you actually care about those things. Mm -hmm. So while it is 10 times as much, um, it's still, you know, so you might say, quote unquote, cheap if you mm -hmm. care about those things. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, I've been on WordPress for, forever, and the problem is every six months or so or less, you get hacked. Like there's some exploit, there's something, and then whenever I went to a WP Engine, not, not that there's a promotion for this, right. but like it didn't happen ever because there's a set of protocols in place to make sure that never happened. Um, so that's why I eventually went. And every so often, you have this hack that like you, you're just not technically inclined enough to fix. And so with WP Engine, what I liked is that you could... Uh, call someone. I don't know if y'all still do it anymore, but it used to be like you call on the phone and like an engineer picked up. And that was always impressive to me. It's not someone just like t intaking your problem. It was someone that's just like, oh yeah, I can do this protocol real quick and I can change it. And you're like, oh, you really know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, we do have people that know what they're talking about, but this brings up two really interesting general points for all startups mm -hmm. that, that's really useful and not obvious. One is early on, this is what small startups do. They say, when you call us, or open a Zendesk ticket, you get an engineer. Yeah, you probably get a founder even, right? <laughs> now, that's not scalable. Mm -hmm. You can't, we're at now 1,200 people, mm -hmm. many hundreds of millions in revenue, 200,000 customers. So guess what? The founder doesn't answer the phone, <laughs> okay? <Yeah. laughs> um, so this is a great point though, because we did say that for a long time. We're like, look, you can call other people and blah, 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 but for us, you'll get blah, blah, blah. Jack, exactly what you said. Every startup has that advantage. Mm -hmm. Now, on the one hand, it's not scalable. On the other hand, you have that advantage. Incumbents cannot have that advantage. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the very few things that as a small startup, you can have as an advantage. There's almost no advantages when you're new. <laughs> you don't have as much money. You have no brand. Your product sucks because it's new. So it has bugs and doesn't do very much. And uh, and you have no salespeople and no momentum and and probably no money. And, and you have nothing. So you have to take advantage of every little advantage you have. You must take advantage of it. <laughs> this is what you got, you know? This is something you can say and claim for a while, so you should. So that's one point that, that, that there's just like aside from what you said. And then another thing of what you said I think is also generically useful, which is you said, man, I got hacked. And then I was like, gosh, I got to stop that. And that's what you might call an inciting moment or an inciting event. Hmm. So – if I just walk up to a random person and say, look, would you like your site to be faster so you rank higher in Google? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and like you don't want to be hacked, do you? No, no, of course I don't, you know. Okay, so did I just validate the company? No. Mm. Because to your very point, you already know that, and yet you didn't buy it WP Engine until you get hacked a few times. Mm -hmm. Well, what does that mean exactly? What can we learn from that? Even if the person has the problem and knows it, might even be willing to pay in, in the abstract to solve it. Yeah, today's not the day I want to go move my website. Mm -hmm. In fact, I never want to do that. That sounds awful. Like I'd rather do anything else today mm -hmm. than move a website. Like what? And pay more? Why would someone want to do that? The answer is I got hacked and it was a horrible experience. They took over my site. Uh, I had to pay all this money to... Like and a lot, like a lot per hour to have someone unscrew it because you, know, you have to have an expert. And what happens? What if it happens again? I lost, you know, whatever. All kinds of horrible things. And you're like, okay, I never want that to happen. And now you're ready. Mm. Now you're looking. You're ready to buy. Now's the moment. An inciting event had to happen. So for us, there's a few kinds. One is exactly that security. Another kind is. You hired an SEO person, you're, 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 you're paying them one, two, three, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month to advise you and do stuff in SEO. And they say, look, I can't really help you until your site's faster. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, well, if I'm paying this person thousands of dollars a month for SEO and they're saying your site needs to be fast and I can go from a three to $30 a month, <laughs> you can see the third <laughs> order value, right? And, and solve that. And that's the reason because because I hired an expert. Expert told me that could be a reason. It doesn't have to be a bad thing like I got hacked. Mm -hmm. It could be anything. But there was a reason why that was the day that that person decided to get hosting because mm -hmm. they hired someone and told them. So that means – so okay. So, But this starts to give you ideas. Oh, we should get in with SEO people because they create inciting events. Mm. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So not only is this a good observation because it's beyond, oh, you have the pain, so you might buy. It's beyond that. No, and also something has to occur for you to decide, today's the day I'm going to buy. 
Hmm. And furthermore, it gives you ideas. How do, can I make those inciting events or can I get, when that happens, what else is going on? Mm -hmm. Did someone do that? Or is, do, what did they search for then when that event happened? Not just the problem, but that event, that's the keywords I need. So, um, you know, nothing, there's no such thing as a law, a physical law in startups, you know, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> and you have to be creative and so forth, but Hey, at least this gives you this notion that's beyond solving a problem that you could, is also actionable. Mm -hmm that you need to do in order to really make the startup work. So when you said that, that touched on something everybody needs to understand. This sounds like selling burglar alarms. You don't really want to buy one until your neighbor gets robbed. And then you're like, I need a burglar alarm tomorrow. It, right. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I always remember vividly, and I, I remember this, I probably think about this once a week, is back in the day when I first met you, you had an office adjoining like near AppSumo. We're just all in, like these shared offices in Capital Factory here in Austin. And you had a flat screen TV on the on the wall and it said MRR monthly recurring revenue and it was something like two thousand dollars at the time and it was a WordPress host and I always thought like there's so many WordPress hosts this is like a solved problem I don't I don't know what this guy is doing and I think you had some notoriety by then because you had sold your company already so like clearly knows what he's doing but a WordPress host and it was kind of funny because the amount of time we shared that it was like from two thousand to twenty five hundred a month three thousand all that kind of stuff. Did that motivate you quite a bit? Just that, like that number up there on the wall, what was the purpose of like broadcasting that so publicly? Yeah, of course it's, it's fun to, to, um, to put your most important number on the wall and then say, that's what we're trying to do. Um, but it's interesting. Yeah. A lot of people did tell me that they're like, look, you, you built a product company and sold it. Why are you going to like infrastructure? It sounds boring. WordPress mm -hmm. is someone else's project. Servers are boring. Infrastructure is low margin and uh, and low multiple and therefore not valuable. What are you doing? And uh, I think it's good as an entrepreneur to ignore what other people think you should be doing, <laughs> right? They don't know. But on the other hand, do you have a reason for what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Fair question. Like if yeah. they're wrong, then, then how do you know what you're doing is right? <clears throat> how do you know you're not building a company that you yourself don't want to be at? Mm -hmm. And that's not hypothetical because I find that most of the time people build companies and then realize they're unhappy. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean they shouldn't have done it. Maybe it's more a commentary about what it means to be a person that wants to make things and like certain phases of things when it gets to a phase, it's not fun anymore or something like that. It, there's probably more to it than that. But the point being, it's not obvious that you just doing what you feel like will result in something you actually want, mm -hmm. will actually achieve some goal or fulfillment <clears throat> or whatever it is. That's not clear. And in fact, it often doesn't happen. So mm -hmm. how can you be intentional about that? At the time, I wasn't as intentional as I am today, but I was still fairly intentional. And I knew not only did I have the problem and I understood it, and I was excited that the market existed because that's rare, mm -hmm. you know, um, I also love optimization, meaning not cost optimization, although I guess that's kind of fun. I mean, in code, mm -hmm. I always liked it. Like from college and before, I always liked this idea of like, oh, here's a simple algorithm and a slightly better way to do it that shaves a millisecond. Like that just, I love it. Mm -hmm. I can't justify it in any other way than I just love it. Mm -hmm. And this isn't, this is an optimization problem mm -hmm. because you want the site to be as fast as possible. And part of making it scale with traffic is if it's really fast and each request takes a very small amount of time, then you can do a lot per second mm -hmm. with a given amount of server. So speed and scale sort of go hand in hand. They're not exactly the same, especially when you get more sophisticated, but that's roughly true. So in other words, the whole thing is an optimization problem. And I like that. Mm -hmm. So here I am in a great market doing something I love. Now that's a reason. Mm. Now we're talking, now we're getting to, right? So again, as just a general rule, I have more thoughts on, on, on identifying that and figuring that out for yourself. But I do think that's a good place to start as an entrepreneur is, wait, what are my assets? What are my talents? What experience sets do I have? What things do I have that's, that's fairly unique, at least in combination that's unique? Mm -hmm. um, what do I love doing so much that you, you don't even have to pay me to do? Now, it's not true that just because you're passionate, that means it's a business. Again, like that, right? <laughs> I was that, about that, to ask. <laughs> that, that, obviously not, right? It's a st stupid advice. <clears throat> but passion is important, even though it's not the end of the story, because it makes you excited. It gets you through the tough times, <laughs> the dark times. Mm. Um, you can be passionate about a, a cause. You can be passionate about a certain solution, like working on AI. Mm -hmm. Like there's different reasons to be passionate about things. That's mm -hmm. all fine. So you do want that. It's a good place to begin. 
um, you just can't end there because that, that again, that's not a business, not a market, not customers, not why you're different, not why you pay you know, all the stuff we just talked about. It's mm-hmm. not those things. Yeah, but it's part of the Venn diagram of what needs to exist. So it's a, not a bad place to begin and say like, here's a good filter already. Um, filter because it's going playing to my strengths. Of course, any good strategy should play to your strengths Mm -hmm. because a strategy that's excellent, but you can't execute it well is a bad strategy. It's a good strategy for somebody else, not Mm -hmm. good for you. You need something where you have the edge. You have, you know, you're incredibly productive because, because it's like you, because it's, you know, so while that's not a business, it's a component to how are you going to make a successful one? You have to combine that with the problem in the market and all these other things. Uh Uh, Sure. As a Venn diagram, yes, you have to combine and it's hard to find something that has area once you combine. Right. It's hard to make a startup that works. We all know this. It's yeah. difficult to find it. We know. But that at least we're putting our finger on what to do, what the goal is, even though it's hard. At least we're articulating what is it. Well, how many steps forward are you looking at it? Some, I, I don't know if you have any, uh, I'm going to ask you about frameworks and stuff, but how many steps forward are you looking at? You say, I like optimization. I think this is a cool thing I could probably solve. Are you also thinking with your logical brain, like, okay, this is a big enough market. There's other companies out there doing this, making billions of dollars. I could take some of that pie. You are thinking about that as well. Exactly. That, yeah. That's that's the market side. But yeah, one of the one of the very easy things about going into WordPress is even at the time, WordPress was 11% of the internet. Mm -hmm. I used to say, WordPress is 11% of the internet. So it's like, the it's like the internet has is a the number of sites on the internet is like a one followed by an infinite number of zeros mm. and wordpress is just one fewer zero that's how big it is <laughs> now of course i was exact but like if you're starting out that then the internet might as well be infinitely big right because yeah. of that size that's mm-hmm. correct you know and so in other words the market was so large you don't even need to quantify it mm-hmm. it's that big furthermore it was growing again even then and and as as we now know it continued to um, even as a percentage of the internet, which of course itself grows. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that case, it was really obvious the market was large and growing. Now, typically what's uh, typically I, I do think a large and growing market is a good attribute to have. Um, even if you want to be little, because a large growing market has niches everywhere because it's large and it's expanding. And so fissures are there all over the place. So even if you want to say, okay, I'm going to have this, you know, hyper target this thing and stay small, but I'm going to be the absolute best for this niche. Right. Well, you still want a large and growing market to be there. The big people, the big incumbents won't be able to service a small niche Mm. because doesn't make them enough money. So you'll be left alone by the big folks, Mm. but the budgets are there. People are spending money. People write about it. There's, there's journals. Maybe people go to conferences, like all this infrastructure is there. And so you can be the best at some niche. So I still feel, even if you want to be like a one person shop and make a small company uh, in a niche, I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Like I'm not one of these, you know, Silicon Valley. If you don't make a huge company, you're nothing. Not at all. I think they're all different beasts in a Mm. zoo and a menagerie of cool (laughs) stuff, you know? And, and, and like no beast in the zoo is better than another one. They're just different beasts. And that's fun, isn't it? Actually kind of fun that there's a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. So um, not at all. But I still think large growing market, that's that's where it's healthier. Competition's easier because there's, there's abundance. So mm-hmm. People aren't fighting over limited dollars. Mm-hmm. And again, you have these niches. Even if you want to build a huge company, you usually want to start in a small niche anyway to get a foothold and then go. Even, even Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm from decades ago. Mm-hmm. Um, who only was talking about large companies also said the way you cross the chasm is you find a place where you're a niche where you can do and then you expand from there. So like kind of no matter where you look, um, being somewhere large, but you have a niche and then maybe you stay small, maybe you grow whatever, but, but that's just good. Obviously you can build a company in other ways. Again, no laws here, but, um, I think it makes it easier or de-risks it somewhat. So it's smart, smart. So, so whenever you're coming up with these business ideas, are you just going around being like, I want to start a business and then you're writing down a bunch of them? What is the way that, what is the process that you're thinking about it? So I haven't started a business in 14 years. So I don't really have a quote unquote way in which I generate ideas because I'm not generating, I'm not making businesses all the time. Mm-hmm. Now we do think about new products at WP Engine, but building the second or third product or product line within a bigger company fascinating, but different from a startup. Okay. Some of it's similar in that it's a new product, but Mm -hmm. it's also quite different in that you you have this apparatus you're in, which has pluses and minuses, you know, pluses like we have 200,000 customers to sell to, or 
in, or inquire about um, that's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, it's a big, you, know, you can't just put out some crappy MVP because we have a brand, we have a thing. And, mm-hmm. you know, so like it, it, and we have bureaucracy inside that same bureaucracy means we can put out a product and make tens of millions of dollars very quickly, which a startup could never do. It also slows down certain things and, you know, mm-hmm. like, right. It, it's both. Like that's, that's what it is to be a bigger. So um, it's interesting, but it's kind of a different process than, than a startup. Um, are you, phys- are you just getting on the phone and asking people, are you getting on the phone with 50 different customers no, and being no. like, what's your biggest problem? Well, well, uh, we're indirectly, but you have to remember we have hundreds of salespeople. We have many hundreds of people in support with product managers and UX uh, researchers who are proactively like designing questions and questionnaires and interviews and, and executing them. So mm-hmm. yes, yeah, so, often we, so there is some, in some, um, uh, I, I have a process I like for uh, gathering input from all these groups. So my, my feeling is, you know, the picture of the elephant and then there's the blind, quote unquote, wise people. And, okay. and they're each of them are blindfolded and, and touching part of the elephant, one's touching a, a leg and saying, this, this feels like a tree. And one's touching a trunk. It's like, this is a hose, right? So they all uh, understand part of the elephant, but none of them see the elephant because mm-hmm. they're, yeah. You know? So to me, that's what the different departments are like. Sales has, a lot of people say like, salespeople don't know anything about product. They just blah, 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 blah. But they're talking to customers all day long. They don't, it's not true that they know nothing, mm-hmm. but it is true that they're not, um, they're not trained in product and they don't, they maybe don't see the whole elephant. So to me, the idea is like all these constituencies see part of the elephant. So you mm-hmm. need to go to each one and understand what they see and why and do it individually. So that they, so like, for example, I'll go to sales and just, just with sales leaders and so forth, what are you seeing? What should we build? What are the problems? What would help you sell better? Blah, 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 blah. And, and w- the first thing that's interesting is they argue amongst themselves. There's not consensus all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. And that's great because if you just have only them in the room, then they can sort of argue about it from just their point of view, which is great. You kind of go deep that way. Then finally, you get to like a stack rank of these ideas. It's still not proven or validated. That's okay. Uh, right? That, and then you go and you do that with support. You do it with engineering because engineers want to like refactor the code and do some patches and do this other thing they want to do. They want to do stuff again, that that's, they're not wrong, but that's not for customers either. So mm-hmm. you do that with all these groups, obviously customers being more, the more important one. Then as a product manager, you can bring all this together and say, what am I doing with all this? So none of this is telling you what to do, but all of his input that you need, mm-hmm. uh, acknowledging that this is all valuable, but you still need to synthesize it, which is still hard, right? Yeah. You still have this fundamentally hard, complex thing to do, which is to synthesize this into a product to build or the, or the next features to build. But at least you're organized. And when you decide, blah, 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 what's nice is you can then go back to these groups and explain I listened to you and now here's why I'm doing something different. Mm -hmm. So you go back to sales and say, so we, because of this and that, we're going to build this first and, but your number six and seven were both easy. So we're going to knock it out for you. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back to your number two though, because reasons we can't do, you know? And so now you're saying, I heard you, I'm telling you what's going on, even though it's not necessarily what they want to hear. And so you have this great rapport you build Mm -hmm. while getting the input that you need. So that's an example of things you can do at a larger company where you're taking advantage of all this stuff. At a smaller company, uh, you can still do that with one salesperson, obviously, but you don't have to be so formal. But if it's just you, what can you do? Well, at that point, I think you need to just go talk to customers. I don't know any other way to, to do it. <laughs> and it's hard because they don't want to talk to you or potential customers don't. Um, but I would argue if you can't get them on the phone uh, now, then how are you going to get on the phone ever. Like, how are you going to sell the product ever if you just can't get anyone to talk to you? So I agree. It's hard. On the other hand, don't you have to solve this no matter what? <laughs> so go ahead and solve, go ahead and work on that so that you can get some conversations going. So you can try to be creative. I use LinkedIn mm-hmm. and I found people who t- had a title and, and, and position that made sense from what I was looking for, which mm-hmm. is web developers. And then, um, then I sent them in mail that said, um, I'm building a startup that's supposed to be for people like you. So I'd like to get your feedback on it. Now I know your time is valuable because you're a freelancer or whatever there. So I'm not trying to get this for free. I'm happy to pay whatever you want, even Mm. more than your normal hourly rate, because this is a one-off thing for your time, because I actually value your time and your opinion as an expert. Hmm. So out of 50 50 of these that I sent, 40 agreed. Mm -hmm. That's a stupid response rate, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And one person charged me. Mm. And I think, I think it's just a theory, but it's just, uh, I respected them and their time 
And so they didn't, they, they sort of, with, with just basic res, human reciprocity, they didn't really feel like, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I'll just help this person out, you know? That's fascinating. <laughs> but even if they all charge, it'd be worth it, right? Because yeah. because then you'd get some real good feedback on stuff. So then, the, then of course, it, how do you interview them? So that's yet another topic. Like what, how, what's a good interview? Like, how do you learn? So that's true too. But nevertheless, that's what you, um, that's what you've got to do to go find out. So to, back to your initial question was, how would you figure it out? I think you find problems. It's hard to go look for a problem. I, I, I find that doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. Normally you discover it, you you stumble upon it. Oh, I heard this and then I heard that. And I was like, what? And then you go, or maybe you had the problem yourself. I feel like this is, this is kind of where that happens. You don't usually go out and research and discover a problem. You mm -hmm. could, I suppose. It just doesn't seem like it's the usual origin story. So I would expose myself to stuff. That's what I would do because that's how I would try to find problems. And then, um, then I would use these techniques, like I'm saying, to go try to validate, oh, I think I understand something. Let me go see. Um, so at WP Engine, fortunately, we're constantly, we have hundreds of people constantly talk to customers. So we're constantly having ideas. We're constantly seeing pain that we could solve. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, is that good enough? Is, does it, is it big enough? Is it important enough? But that's one nice thing about a bigger company is you, you're constantly seeing stuff. This suggests, for example, if you're right out of school and have no experience, and you're like, so I don't have any problems. So it suggests what kind of place could you go work at where you'd be exposed to a lot of different customers and problems mm. that could be in sales at some startup that's growing fast. It could be in a consulting shop. I mean, doing stuff like McKinsey consulting, which is, you know, that, that it's uh, it's difficult to get that job, but man, you will learn how to do a lot of useful things and you will see a lot of businesses and see all the problems in there because it's your job to analyze markets and businesses. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get exposure to a lot of stuff that might give you some ideas. So again, you might think, well, if, if I got to get exposure to things, there are some jobs which will give me more exposure than others. Um, so if that's really important to you, that could be something you select. Huh. I really like that line that don't go looking for a problem. I feel like we all, I, I certainly get into that where I'm just like, oh, I want to start an even bigger business. And I'm like, what could I do? And you start from there. And I, it's not a bad way to look at it. Like you said, I don't think there's any like formal way to do this. But at the same time, when you do go hunting for problems and asking people about it, you get a lot of people that are like, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. You get that kind of like eh, hesitant. I'm not going to pay for it now type of thing. That's right. But the times when enough people have told me that I'm just like, oh, God, this is becoming the common theme. I'm like, well, yeah, I think I could sell this pretty easy. <laughs> exactly. Huh. That, that's really awesome. Let's switch gears a little bit. Talk about WordPress. Near and dear to my heart. This has paid for my college. Uh, <laughs> WordPress has been an integral part of my life. Small side story. Matt Mullingwood, I guess, founder of WordPress, the, the WordPress Jesus. Yep. Um, I've met a lot of famous people in my time. I don't really get starstruck that often. But with Matt Mullenweg, I knew nothing about him, honestly, other than I heard him on the Tim Ferriss show once. And I met him on a, on, a, on a cruise boat at a conference. And he was standing right next to me. And we were all like packed in. He kept bumping into me. I was like, it's Matt Mullenweg. And then I talked to him for 45 minutes in the, in the line. And he also played instruments. He was from Houston as well. Yeah, plays the sense. And I use this uh, software every single day of my life, maybe eight hours a day. So for some reason, I felt super connected to him more so than any celebrity I've ever seen in my entire life. I think, I think you said the reason. Yeah. You just spent so much time <laughs> yeah. with something that he's familiar with as well. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's how much the internet runs on WordPress again? 43%. Percent. Yeah. Okay. I think there was this massive missed opportunity with Discus and I use WordPress less than I used to before because it's kind of missed the social world. Right. right. Like with Twitter, I can post uh, a small blog post, the tweet, and it gets instantaneous responses. With my blog, I have to post on the blog, but then also send it out on social media or email. And I feel like WordPress missed that. And I thought a long time ago that WordPress would start to decline. However, here we are and it's increased and shows no sign of stopping. Well, even, even when you do social media on your own, you got to link to something and that something's going to be a WordPress site half the time. Yeah. So it, all, so it all grows. Ends up, yeah. <laughs> you know, so everyone said social media will kill uh, blogging or, or content or WordPress. But again, like you link to something. So no, it doesn't. And you still need websites. Just like people have been predicting the demise of email. But I don't know about you. I still get a lot of email. It's uh, still the you know. primary form of <laughs> yeah. yeah. Slack said they'd kill email. No, it doesn't kill email. It's just another dang inbox. But um, I think... Um, they may have missed it. Well, somebody missed an opportunity with Discuss. I guess Discuss missed the opportunity with Discuss. 
Um, for people that don't know, this is commenting software, but it was uh, scalable, centralized. They did some stuff with uh, tr trying to prevent spam, although that wasn't very good. But they had other things. And one of the things that was neat is when the social networks appeared, it you could do things like comment, but also put that comment on Twitter, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's good. That like helps connect it. Probably maybe needed some stuff coming the other way. That would be interesting. Some stuff on Twitter coming in. What was amazing about comments in WordPress, whether it was discuss based or not, is you created your own little community. Because mm -hmm. for each each po each article, um, people would talk, and it would often be the same people. And so you just kind of get used to them. They get used to each other. They talk to each other. So it wasn't quite like a Slack channel, although that would be amazing. <laughs> that that, that yeah. would have, you know, in retrospect, like that would have been a great direction for it to grow into. Mm -hmm. um, but it definitely was a community. And certain sites in particular was were kind of known for that, like Coding Horror and AVC, and, 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 which were blogs similar to my space, were known for having like a, a community in there that was where mm -hmm. the community was sometimes better than the post. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I, I also had comments on my uh, my blog. But I do agree that it missed, it missed, it, it, they missed the social era where it could have been integrated such that you could get new readers via social, but via that, yeah. like that just seems like a logical thing. And of course, vice versa. Um, I just, it just feels like that would be great. And uh, to this day, you can't, I mean, live fire, like there was, there was things that came out to do that. No one quite captured it and did it. Certainly no one's like a big winner there. Yeah. It, well, one of the big things I was relatively technical and even spam prevention for me was, was very difficult. It yeah. was kind of a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And I wanted anonymous comments because people could leave anonymous comments and you didn't have to say who you were. And you got, I, in my opinion, sometimes better discussion. You also got the people that say, I hate you and leave. And you're like, yeah, whatever. But I, I think it was just so hard to leave comments and that something like Discuss kind of solved that problem. Um, I was a little disappointed. And nowadays, I'm actually seeing what should have happened a long time ago, or in my opinion, should have happened. And what happened, I thought was, Everyone went to forums instead to have discussions. So the old school internet forums, bulletin boards, what have you. And then I feel like Facebook groups came along and that absorbed, I think, the whole internet <laughs> into Facebook groups. And now I'm seeing all that spill out. So it all went into that bucket. And now it's all trickling out. And a lot of people are like, I don't want to run a Facebook group. No. There's some problems with it. It's good for some things. Uh, for example, everyone's just on it. You know, it's got 2 billion people, uh, but it's not the, the best place because now you're on Facebook, you get distracted. I think the quality of people can sometimes be low. And so people are moving back into these community forums. And I feel like WordPress has kind of missed this whole area. Um, do you see more people going towards some sort of like social platform rather than just using WordPress? Well, no doubt. I mean, everyone's got a social plat platform, whether you own your own, like some kind of news group or whatever, but, or you, uh, or discord or Slack channel or something like that, mm -hmm. or a sub stack, um, or you, um, or you're on Twitter and all the other things. I mean, I think everyone's multi-channel at this point, if they care about content, that is, then uh -huh. they're multi-channels. Like that's, that's just it. I don't know that WordPress necessarily missed it, quote unquote, in that it's a CMS. It's not necessarily supposed to be all of the things. Mm -hmm. Um, but could it be more integrated with certain things? Could could it certainly have done more with the comments because that is inside the CMS? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think there the answer is yes. But it's not too late either. It's forty three percent of the internet. It's open in every way. You, it can can be open, open source, open community, open you know, mm -hmm. and so uh, open APIs. So if there's something to be done, we can do it now. <laughs> mm, good point. <laughs> so maybe you just found your next startup. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it's something I'm complaining about and not doing nothing about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting. Um, are you part of any of these communities? Do you still use forum? Do you use social media? I mean, I know you use Twitter, obviously. Um, what other platforms do you use to meet people or? I don't know if they meet a lot of people, but uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, threads. The standard stuff. Yeah. Just the standard stuff. And I just uh, post the same thing everywhere, which you're not supposed to do. <laughs> um, and I mostly write and don't read that much. Although I read all the, and respond to all the, the people who respond to me and I do follow some people and respond to them, but uh, um, I don't, pri I don't, I don't primarily do social media. I feel like what I write, well, obviously except for the company, but in terms of my personal work, when I write long form, that's my that's my thing. That's what I've been doing for 16 years. Mm -hmm. And that's where I have special content, you know, that's unique to me. Um, and uh, 
I think that's why people are interested in anything I do is for, because of that content, not because of what I say on social media. So um, that's where I want to spend most of my time. If I'm if I'm thinking about content, it's about long form. Right? So when you, do you uh, let, do you think of an idea and go, hmm, that make a good article, or do you have like a drafts? Yeah. Area. Yeah, if hundreds of drafts, hundreds of drafts, and then yeah. something picks up and you're like, oh, this could be a real article. Yeah, it's very inspiration based. In other words, I'll just I'll there'll be one. You know, I'll have just a couple sentences somewhere, just randomly someday, some hour. I'm like, oh my God. And then that'll turn into suddenly 2000 words. And, you know, like it's just very, so I would say a real writer would sit down and write every day. Mm -hmm. So I'm not that, <laughs> <laughs> right? But that's good. That's a luxury to say, oh, well, you know, if I don't feel like it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if I feel like it, then bang, I can do, I can, I can be very productive because I'm in the zone, you know? Yeah. And so, um, and so I have that kind of fits and starts, but since I have so much stuff in draft and in different stages of draft from an idea to like, this is pretty much ready. I just think I should edit it again, you know, kind mm -hmm. of a thing. Um, I can, I can regularly put stuff out cause I have this, this, this big pipeline of stuff at all, at all times. And is this how you got your first couple of clients for WP Engine? Was it like people following no. your blog? No, I had 18,000 RSS subscribers. RSS, nice. Back in the day <laughs> through FeedBurner. Yeah, remember that? Oh, yeah. And uh, I launched WP Engine and two people signed up. Hmm. 18,000 to two. Not a good conversion rate. No. Um, I had 30 people when I launched. None, none of them were those people. Those were all people that I was calling, like I was just saying. You know, I just, just, you just kind of muscle them in. Yeah. That's how you can get your first customers. Um, so... Uh, yeah, that didn't work. Now, in retrospect, like that's a, that kind of makes sense in that I was writing about startups and marketing and geek, geeky things, not about WordPress and writing and content. And so, uh, you know, the the person I was writing for is not necessarily the person. Mm -hmm. I still thought I'd get a lot of them because, okay, I'm writing to people who do startups. Don't they all have a website? Mm -hmm. And at the time, isn't fifteen percent, twelve or fifteen percent of those WordPress? So, so you know, some of those should convert, right? And so, mm -hmm. still not true though. Um, now, what it was useful for is hiring because what mm. would happen is people are like, oh my gosh, I've been reading you for years and now um, dude, I want to, you know, I like the way you think. I want to join the company. That's powerful, especially when you're new, new startup, because then it's the riskiest. Mm -hmm. It is risky to join the startup. You're, you're paying them very little and it's risky. And of course, you're giving them stock. So hopefully everything goes well. In our case, it did. And so we made millionaires out of that. So isn't that great? Uh, but you didn't know that at the time. <laughs> you know, it was high risk. So that's an example of something where, oh, wow, that gave me this big leg up, at least with some people, in getting some talent that perhaps, perhaps wouldn't have otherwise, you know, threw their lot in with us. And so that was very handy. Oh, well, why did you first start writing online. I'm sure you weren't thinking like this could help me hire down no. the line. What, what was in it for you? Yeah. So I started writing in the previous company that was called Smart Bear. Mm -hmm. That's why the blog is called A Smart Bear even now. And I, I wanted to be uh, the voice of the company, like uh, 37 Signals blogs was. You mm -hmm. know, people would write on it and be like, this is our voice. Um, and then no one wrote on it but me, which maybe does explain our, <laughs> it does give you a window on the culture of the company. Um, but uh, um yeah, so so it was uh, as simple as that. Just kind of like a blogging was cool in two thousand five, and so like let's or two thousand six. So let's just uh, let's do it. I'd written a book um, on code review, which of course uh -huh. sounds really boring, but it was obviously for marketing. So this was maybe an extension of like, okay, this writing this book really helped, which it did. That's a whole other fun story. Um, so maybe just blogging, you know, writing in general, being a thought leader seems to work for us. Let's. Um, Let's blog. Let's let's be about us. Let's you know. So that's how it started. Just uh, just like that. Um, they let me keep the blog after we sold the company. I wrote it into the the paper even, and it was one of the largest traffic generators to the corporate website. Hmm. And so they were like, "Yeah, just keep doing that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that sounds good." Yeah, you uh, are the marketing. What well, what do you what do you think about that? Like, uh, people have these social brands. I've seen it go through trends. I think where people used to like. So if I was with AppSumo, like writing under AppSumo. But now it's just like everyone's writing under their own name, it seems. And I think that's a lot more common than it used to be. I started one of the first financial blogs online where I said how much money I was making so this is like you know, 20 years ago. And that was a big deal because I feel like back then people didn't even talk about money openly. It was very uncouth to talk about that. That's right. And now people are like, I make $25,000 a month on the, it's just right in their Twitter bio. It's just like right. totally normal. <laughs> um, what's your thought on like the social brand, where that's going or anything? 
Yeah, I think it's pretty cool, actually. I think um, I think there's a macro trend. I think it's probably obvious, but there's a macro trend at, that just gets stronger as the person in question that gets younger, which is that they just don't have these personal secrets. Hmm. So even stuff like, oh yeah, I've got nude photos of myself because I sent it to my, you know, to whoever I was going out with and they posted it. And I'm like, dang it. Oh, well. And so like, there's this joke of like, that should be like in my generation, that's a career ender. Yeah. In new generation, it's like, well, we all have one who gives a crap. Mm -hmm. What else? What else is on the resume? You know, like yeah. who cares? So it's this thing of like, that doesn't really matter. How much money you make doesn't matter. Oh, you're like t posting on Twitter about how you have a mental illness of some kind. You're yeah. like, whatever, dude, you know? And so it's just the younger you get, the more it's like, this is me. And so even in a professional context, like you say, like I'm going I'm to use my name and I'm going to be open in a way that is not usually... I think overall, this is really healthy. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of honesty and an introspection and uh, vulnerability as being a way to relate to other people, mm -hmm. even in business. Um, and so if we're saying we're more honest and open about who we are and we're accepting that, mm -hmm. doesn't that sound really healthy? I, I think so. So could it be bad too? Yes. Everything has, everything is, <laughs> everything's everything, you know, the, the, I get that. It's like, of course, they're not necessarily, but um, I mean, if you were forced to do that against your will, that would obviously be really bad. But if there's this general trend where people choose to, it seems healthy to me. Yeah. In my world, it feels like everyone does it. In fact, that's probably the primary way I interact with a lot of my friends, just harassing them on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but then you go out into the world and there's a lot of people who, um, who don't. Yeah. They, they maybe have a, a private Instagram where they share photos of their kids and it's only people who follow you. Yeah. But like for us to put public things out, I think is uh, not unique, but it is uh, unusual for the super average population. I, I really don't know. Hmm. I don't know what the average person even means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. Average in America, average, like, what does that mean? I don't, I don't even know. I mean, there, you're, being a thought leader. I'm, I'm sure, that, I'm sure there's an answer. I, I'm just saying, I personally do not know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just, uh, I always wrestle with that. Should I just write for my company or should I write under my own name? And it sounds like the trend is going right on writing under your own name is probably the best way to do it right now. I, I, with these kind of questions, I often go back to what is your goal here, mm -hmm. which is a kind of a generic answer. I know. So le le let me be more specific. If your goal, for example, is to say, I'm building up this newsletter and then I'm going to sell it someday. Mm -hmm. I don't want to run this newsletter forever. I want to build it, sell it. Um, then writing under i mean not that you can't say by neville there but like making it most the brand about the newsletter and not about you mm -hmm. enables you to sell it mm. whereas if it's your name everywhere you can't sell it because the because the, the, your name is the brand mm -hmm. and as soon as it's <clears> not <throat> that or you're not writing it you, you, i mean if someone else is writing it under your name that's really weird yeah and as soon as you're not writing it do they have to rename it and if they do does doesn't like most of the brand equity walk out the door that's true so how would they how are you going to sell it or sell it for a reasonable price mm -hmm. so if you so this is what i'm getting at so if if the goal is i want to sell this someday then i would say great then build up the brand not you. You can be there. You can you can even have that byline, right? But the brand is what you're building up so that you can sell the brand and you can actually sell it and be separable from it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're like, no, this is my life's work, or I may build brands and products elsewhere, but this particular thing is my newsletter. Mm -hmm. This is my core. This is me. Oh, well, then the, you could you could still do the brand thing, of course, uh, but you don't have to because you just said you never want to get rid of it. So it's like, oh, well, if you don't want to get rid of it, then there's no harm in making it you. So th that's, that's specifically what I mean by like, well, what are you, where's this going? Cause you might yeah. make different choices to make that path make sense. Uh, question about AI. Are you using AI in any significant way? Yes. Coding, especially it's frightening. Um, I don't look anything up anymore. I ask it and it, you know, gives you a code sample. It's right enough of the time. Um, I use Copilot inside Visual Studio. It's frightening, uh -huh. frightening. And you know it's going to get better. I think that's what's even more frightening. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, with writing, again, like because the – because so if content were my business, mm -hmm. I would be very much more into like how do I get it to write in a style and generate content and stick it everywhere and I don't know, whatever. I'd be interested in that, I guess. For me, the writing is not a business for me. It is my personal expression. 
Mm -hmm. It's me ex trying to hone my craft, myself, trying to be the best self I can be, my own ideas that are new, that I want to put out in the world in my particular style. That's what it is for me, in my mm -hmm. case. Therefore, using AI to write it is completely counter to what I want. Mm -hmm. So not interested at all in that, not even a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why people read it too, because they're like, this is this style and, and either I like it or I like it enough. Yeah. Or, okay, here's some new ideas and they're good enough, often enough that I want to read it. Um, and so they, I think the audience also would not like it if I did that. So ne neither one of us wants me to do it, so yeah. I'm not doing it. Um, I will use AI in writing a little. For example, um, I use it as like a super thesaurus. Mm. Like not just another word for X, mm -hmm. but like, uh, I'm trying to and you know generate 10 ways to kind of say this and then it'll generate things. And then what I find is I don't like any of them, but oh, the way it said this in the second half here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The, it's used the word incisive. I forgot. Yeah. That that's the right word. Okay. And, and, oh, I kind of like this. And like, now I've put together a, a, another thing, but I was unblocked and inspired by mm -hmm. what was said. So as a thesaurus, I like that because I still feel like I'm forming it. I'm using it to almost like an editor or, a, you know, something like that. Um, I also, <laughs> um, I, I also find it interesting. I'll, I'll ask it to do things like generate tweets for this article. Cause I do, when, when I post a new article, I'll then have tweets mm -hmm. and I use it to, I have like a system where it, it you know, prompts of whatnot to, to generate tweets. Once again, like I've never used a tweet that it generated verbatim. Yeah. It's never right. It's never in my language. It's often way too markety. I hate the whole like, Hey, do, 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 hashtags, you know, like, Oh my God, never. Right. But again, like, It'll just pick out different pieces of the article to say something about. And often I'm like, oh, you're right. That part, mm -hmm. you can say something about that. Mm -hmm. And then I'll write my own thing. But just the fact that it plucked out little bits and pieces is like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is a thing to say. That is a little unit I could talk about to then promote the article for the rest of the units. And so that, again, is like a jogger for me. That's really helpful. Um, it doesn't feel in any way like I'm compromising something that I'm trying to do. Are you afraid of where AI is going? Um, I am afraid of its impact on everybody. I think, I do think that ultimately it'll be helpful and net positive as technology often is, but it will happen so quickly. It is happening so quickly. Will we have time to adjust? Will we have the usual, like everyone likes to pull up, point out like America used to be 70% agriculture and now it's four and we're fine. Mm -hmm. But of course that happened over many, many decades mm -hmm. and it was still disruptive even so. Mm -hmm. So you say, okay, here's the thing that's going to happen in five years or 10 years. What? <laughs> you know, like, so the, the speed at which it happens, I think is the issue as opposed to the fact that the world changes, which we already knew. Mm -hmm. Um, that's frightening. Um, I think another interesting thing is I think people, if, if you rewound back to like the eighties, people were worried that robots would replace all the manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. What actually happened is the manufacturing jobs went to other countries. Mm -hmm. So their jobs were lost, but not because of robots, interestingly. Mm. Um, and then even still now we're like, but still like uh, maybe servers and restaurants will be replaced by robots. We're still on the robot thing. And then probably that's true. But it, now with, with the AI, it's like, no, 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 it's, it's the writers and the coders and the artists, the mm -hmm. photographers and the designers that will be replaced by, by AI, by robots, quote unquote. And it's like, wait, what? That, wait, wait, I thought it was the other way around, right? Yeah. Plumbers are like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, the truck drivers are like, you said we were dead 10 years ago. Yeah. Here we are. You know? <laughs> so, um, I guess the point is we don't know who's going to get replaced and how fast. That's the point. We don't know. We've, we thought we've known for quite a while now. We keep being wrong about that. Um, but it does feel like some things are accelerating, especially in the, in, in the, you know, LLM world. And so it's, it's frightening how fast and how uncertain it is. Mm -hmm. Being uncertain is frightening and the speed is, uh, is frightening. I think you add that up. It's, it, of course it's frightening and nobody has a comprehensive answer. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm not, that's not blaming anybody. And yet we have to proceed because it's the Moloch problem. Everyone's going to, everyone's going to do AI. So if you don't do it, then 
you haven't prevented this from happening. Mm -hmm. You've just prevented you from owning it. So you want to happen. So you want it in your own country and you want your own, but just a new um, oligopoly or, or even feudal techno feudal situation that's happening, of course. And so is that really great? Nope. The whole point of open AI was to prevent that. Obviously it did the, just the opposite. So yeah, that, that didn't work out. And so um, that is all frightening. All that stuff is frightening. Mm -hmm. Well, one piece of solace I get from that is I always thought when I was young and the internet was coming about, I knew a lot of people who worked in a completely analog world. And they thought, well, I mean, if if my job is to send this letter from here to there and now you can just do it digitally, you don't need me. And I remember thinking, well, you need to learn a new thing. And it's funny because now that I'm older, I'm thinking, am I just feeling that same thing? It is a little bit that I know the clock cycles are speeding up for sure, but I also do find solace that every era of history that I've read about, there was a technology that they were all afraid of, that they all, a lot of people rebelled against and a few were benefited by. And then later they were like, yeah, that re replaces lame jobs, the jobs that people didn't want. Uh, here's another thing. What, what, what job did the internet replace that was lame? What job doesn't exist anymore because of the internet? I always think of like, because I'm in the writing world, I always think of things like the local reporter in Cleveland, Ohio, that ran a dating relationship column. Each each locale that, had like a little person. Exists. That had, that job still exists in a much amplified way where one girl could give out a bunch of dating device on the internet. Well, and there are like of millions of, of sites and places where people write these articles. Probably. So that yeah. still exists. Yeah. That job still exists. True. So what jobs are eliminated? Because like when you have self-driving cars, you actually eliminate the truck driver, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. It's not like that job still exists in a different form, learn new tools, mm -hmm. which is what happens to the writers. And with the internet, you still write. It's just, there's a different medium. You do have to learn new tools. It's a different medium. Things change. Uh, jobs, specific jobs go away. Other jobs appear. The, tr the driver, just, like manufacturing did not come back. Mm -hmm. It went away and stayed away. Mm -hmm. Truck drivers go away, stay away once trucks can drive themselves. Mm -hmm. So with AI, it feels to me more like that. Mm -hmm. So like how much writing jobs will be here? Oh, there will be. There'll be writing jobs. I will still be writing because if I'm writing from my experiences and I have a style and da, 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 that's still valuable for the reason it's valuable now. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, f there's 5 billion humans that who are online, mm -hmm. which PS, there's billions who are not still. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Anyway, there's 5 billion humans who are online at this very moment. I'm competing against all of them right now for writing. Mm. Well, also AI. Yeah, I know, but like I've already competed with 5 billion mm -hmm. people. So um, uh, I'm already doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I feel like there's most writing that exists online won't be necessary because AI will do it and probably do it better for uh, on average because most people are bad writers. Like library sites. In I just, SEO I just world, mean most like, human beings are bad at writing. Yeah, <laughs> and AI is better than them even now at writing most things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like they should, it should right. That's just simply better. Not for me. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not just saying that because like I think I'm the best writer ever. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying like I have a purpose and a sp and, and I'm already competing with everything for that. So that's mm -hmm. why I can say that. But for a random memo that I'm sending or most of the content on the internet, which mostly is garbage. Mm -hmm. Of course, ChatGPT4 right now is better than most of that. Mm -hmm. So including the hallucinations, by the way, because a lot of that stuff's wrong yeah. already. So it's like, no, no, this is better than most of that right now. Well, I, I was trying to think of in the future what's going to happen. And I always just think of process that I'm currently doing. It's just easy for me to relate. And for example, we're recording this podcast right now. Afterwards, I get a file. I take that. I download that file. I send it to someone. Uh, they chop it up into videos. I have to put a blog post. I have to create an email. And I can have certain people do this, but it's just like, there's what I call like lame shit that you don't really want to do, but you kind of have to do right to get the distribution for this and for it to make sense business wise. Exactly. And I'm just like, can't AI just do all that? Yeah. yeah. What? I mean, that's clearly. And, and it can, it's yeah. just not set up in that way yet, but it's like in a year. Well, that's or two. obviously that will happen. Yeah. Right? That's like very clearly right. going that way. So those are jobs that will, that will uh, let's just say there will be many fewer of them. Mm -hmm. The end. Like, like, I, I mean, you just don't need someone to cut up the thing. Now you can say, wait, but what about really amazing video? What about art? Yes, exactly. So mm -hmm. that's, that's where I think it's uncertain. Mm -hmm. uh, so does that mean we get way high quality everything because human beings still do have a job? It's to make something so good that AI can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope so, because that would be a better world. It's sort of like how 
Netflix, well, HBO first and then Netflix. And then everybody said, wait, TV can just be better. Mm -hmm. And they just started doing it. And all of a sudden, all TV is so much better now than it ever was because they did that. Mm -hmm. So that's more TV and more jobs, by the way, than ever before, mm -hmm. because it turned out we could just do better and, mm -hmm. then, let, and then let's go. Mm -hmm. So to what extent can AI get rid of mundane so that we can do better and still have the jobs? Mm -hmm. To the extent that's true, that's perfect because we have the jobs and the things are better. Like that's the best outcome. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's it got to be that sometimes it'll be like that and sometimes it will not. Mm -hmm. It's totally unclear to me which is what. Mm -hmm. So what, okay, so you have, you have children, right? What are, are there specific skills that you teach or uh, things that to future proof them essentially? I mean, they're all, well, I think the ones that are, they're, you know, out there on the internet are already learning those skills and already, I mean, kids are better than us at all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like, like they text differently than we text already. The language is different. The stuff that they think is okay or not is different. Like they're already ahead of us on these things. So uh -huh. I, I suppose if if your child does not have access to the internet at all or any of these things and therefore is getting no experience with it, yeah, that's that's a problem because they'll be behind. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, like you know, they're kids. They, uh, they they're the ones deciding what the future will be like <laughs> more than we are. That's a that's a great point. That's the best answer I've ever heard on that. Uh, so quick questions and answers uh, to wrap up. So in WordPress, uh, what is the most popular trend? you're seeing right now is anything cool happening there block based themes mm, yes um blocks being reusable components that you can drag and drop and sometimes nest and use if they're layout type of things and it's everything from very simple things like a title and a picture and a movie to very complex things like entire layouts that do cool things on different devices and you know you can click and it's it does fancy interactive stuff you know it could be any number of things so it used to be uh, you buy a theme, it looks a very certain way, and maybe you can tweak some colors, you know, and like, otherwise that's your, and an image, and otherwise that's your theme. Um, with blocks, though, it can begin, oh, here's a layout, here's another one, here's some ideas, just to get you going, you know, but then, well, I want it to be a little wider, I want to drag, I want to replace this whole thing, da -da -da. and you can literally drag and drop and do that, not writing any code, mm -hmm. and make it whatever you want. So how cool to to have a look and feel and a place to begin and then do whatever you want all on your own very empowering, which is maybe part of the whole WordPress story is to empower people um, with not very much money and not very much uh, development skills to nevertheless be online and do do their thing online. Uh, if you were starting a business today, what industry area would you start? So I, at this point, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to start another company. <laughs> um, and I don't need to. I made enough money. I can just do what, what is fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, we already talked about how I'd go about it though. Yeah. So maybe that's the answer. If you say like you have to, it's like, all right, well that's, you know, um, I would take what I, I guess I would take what I currently know about, know from WP engine, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the things I've seen, I've seen the problems and spaces, you know, they, and, and say like, well, that's something I know about. So that's a good place to begin. Mm -hmm. And then I would have to apply my own logic about markets and interviews to try to figure out what is the right, uh, is there, is there actually a good business in here somewhere? Um, are there any like marketing experiments, hacks, fun things y'all did at WP Engine that really worked or really flopped? Well, a lot of the, so now we're so methodical and so advanced that, uh, you know, we try stuff, but, but it's not, a, not hacks. I think what I'd say is, um, events like going to events it, did a lot better than you'd think. Hmm. Not even necessarily having a booth. You can just walk around and talk to people. Yeah. Um, or walk around with a backpack that's very obvious, that's like some crazy ass new thing so that it's a conversation starter. Maybe you're giving things away that mm -hmm. you kind of have back there. You can get a lot done there and you can talk to a hundred people, practice mm -hmm. your pitch that many times, see mm -hmm. their re reactions to things, which helps you hone the pitch. You can maybe even interview them a little um, in the moment, even if you're just standing in line for food and you, you could get a lot out of a day or two. So that's a, that's a, that's a, thing people I think sleep on a little bit, the in-person thing like that. Another, th another th lesson I think is, um, sometimes you try some marketing channel doesn't work. You're like, all right, that doesn't work, but it does work. You just didn't do it right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it doesn't mean you should just keep banging your head against it. You should stop and move on. But what it means is a year or two later, you might try that again or, but with some difference, like, um, somebody else does it, someone else who's supposedly an expert. Mm. It's very easy to say, well, I'm the founder, I know everything, 
I know my business and my customers better than anyone in the world. I tried whatever, let's say affiliate marketing, it didn't work. So therefore affiliate marketing doesn't work for us. Mm -hmm. So when, when then you hire some consultant later to help with marketing or hire one person in marketing and they're like, I want to, I want to do affiliate marketing. You say, no, I already tried that. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily correct. Mm -hmm. We, ex I experienced this multiple times. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe I did it wrong. Probably that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe it was the wrong message. Maybe this or that. Um, and maybe it still will fail again. I mean, who knows? But like, uh, there's no, there, I wouldn't be so quick to say that doesn't work. Uh, m m maybe it didn't work that one time and it's the door might still be open. Um, what about a book that's changed your life? Um, certainly one that's changed my outlook on thinking is a book that's not even about that. It's a book called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy um, by Rummelt. And it's a, it's a good book. It's, it's, it's about exactly what it says. What is a good strategy? What is a bad strategy? And, and yes, you could summarize that in a couple of pages. But at the same time, if you just read a couple of pages, you'd forget it. And sometimes if you read the whole book and you get a lot of examples, it really sinks in and you really remember it. So mm -hmm. there could be, there's sometimes a reason for the, having a book. What it does not do is tell you how to make a good strategy. It just describes what they look like when they're good and bad, but not how to make one. That was my big disappointment with the book. But the, <laughs> but the description of what it is, is is poignant. And what what really, uh, the reason it changed my thinking is it, it poked at and, and deflated these things people would do about strategy, which I personally always thought that's bullshit. That's mm -hmm. not right. That's, that's, but yet, but this is luminary or these big academics or the CEO of some big company, some public company said it or, you know, and so I'm like, I guess they're right. I guess I don't understand strategy because I look at that and think that's stupid, mm -hmm. but they're that person. So I'm, uh, that means I don't know strategy. But seeing this really well articulating exactly what I think mm -hmm. <laughs> made me think, oh, you could say I was right all along, or you could say something a little softer and say, my point of view was just as valid. Mm -hmm. Forget right and wrong. Maybe it's right sometimes. I don't know. But my point of view was valid. The way, I, since I was being thought, I wasn't just being like, I hate you because you're you. I was being thoughtful about like, this is why it doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um. It was. It would have been okay for me to follow that and say, "Okay, well, is there something that does make sense to me, or can I at least articulate that in a way that's uh, intellectual, mm -hmm. like explain why I don't like that, or explain why I do like other things, so I can start to form my own theories about the world and how I want to operate mm -hmm. that's at least self consistent, <laughs> you know?" Um, and, and that book sort of opened my eyes to like. No, no, no. Some of that, some of that stuff you were thinking that was, that was right or right for you anyway. Mm -hmm. And you should have held on to that and gone with that. Um, so that was part of what made me think, okay, so I'm gonna have these ideas and I can write them in these posts and articles mm -hmm. and I myself might disagree with them in 10 years. And I do sometimes mm -hmm. I, I change and move on. I better or else I'm never <laughs> learning anything, you know, but that's okay. I'm playing with ideas and putting ideas out there in a way that's crisp and, and, and it's like strongly makes that case. Mm -hmm. And so anybody, whether it's me or someone else will read it and either think, Ooh, I like that. Maybe they put that tool in their tool belt or, eh. or even that's exactly wrong. They think mm -hmm. in which case they've also just put a tool in their tool belt as well mm -hmm. by reacting to me in a negative way, or at least, you know, contrary way, let's say, mm -hmm. Th that means you just figured out what you actually think about that. <laughs> That's a learning. You can put that in your tool belt. I still helped you put a tool in your tool belt, even though we disagree about it. <laughs> nice. Perfect. So I kind of just had this realization of like, oh, that's what I got to do. Put it out there. And with, whether you strongly agree or disagree, you have got a tool in your tool belt now. And I've done something good in the world. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and the only way to fail there is you say something so banal or generic or not saying much of anything that you're just not saying anything. Yeah. That's the, that's the only bad thing is say nothing, which is what most of the web is and what AI can do too. <laughs> they can I remember say nothing. <laughs> I remember something you said about validation. I, I forgot where this was, but you said something about like validation is more about proving a product wrong or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, I feel like when you talk to people and you said this earlier and you're like, you like this and they're like, yeah, that's a maybe. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because if you say, great, can I, let me get your payment information. What do they say? 
Sometimes they say yes, and you're starting to really validate now. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's validation. A wallet is validation. But usually they're like, well, yeah. and it's like, right. It's not necessarily a no either, but it's, it's a maybe. Yeah. But they say no sometimes. No means no. Mm -hmm. So if they say like, no, I wouldn't use that, then they're really not. And if you build it, they're still not. <laughs> they, yeah. They've already decided not. So a lot of times when you validate, you definitely get the no's, which is great. And the yeses or maybes, still useful, <laughs> still uh -huh. good, you know, yeah. still, still progress, but just, you know, take it for what it is. Um, another fun thing here is there's a lot of areas of life <clears throat> where you can succeed and win by just not doing the bad thing. Like, it's like everyone says you got to have a vision and you have a goal and direction. Even I said that during this, right? Yeah. And of course, of course, that makes sense. But truthfully... You can get really far just by not screwing up or not doing things that are bad, not doing things that are wrong, not doing things that customers outright say no. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how far you can get. So like, um, for example, in chess, I read somewhere something about like, um, so there's something called a blunder, which means a move that's really bad, like now you're losing the game. Now, at my level, which is low. I mean, the other person is is so bad that they they probably don't understand how to punish me for that. Yeah. And they probably blunder too, you know? So like for me, it doesn't totally end the game, <laughs> but it might, you know, at the high level, it definitely does. Cause yeah. you know, um, so there's this comment of something like, yeah, you know, if you just don't blunder, you're going to get up to like 17, 1800 rating, which is pretty good. It's mm -hmm. like definitely more than top 1% of the, uh, better than 1% of the, you know, 98% of everybody. Um, and I was like, huh? So I went back to my own games and I looked at like 50 games and something like 95% of them, the outcome of the game was determined by whoever blundered less. Hmm. That's it. Whoever didn't. So the idea that, that again, at a high level, it's different, but okay. At a level that 99% of us would play at in chess, if you just make fewer mistakes, you'll win on average or, you know, or like that explain, let's just say that explains a lot of it. And uh, there was a similar kind of study in, in American football, mm -hmm. and again, it was this thing of like, if you count the number, uh, if you count the number of penalties, and the amount of yards you lost by penalties, mm -hmm. and the amount of yards you lose by getting sacked, which basically means, if you don't know, like it means that uh, um, the defense really took down the offense before they got started, and they lost distance on the field. If you take this lost yardage, in other words, lost distance. Um, something like 70% of the, of all games are determined, you know, can be predicted that way. This, this reminds me of how like Floyd Mayweather fights. Yes. Just he don't just get avoids hit. getting hit and it's really boring to watch him fight, honestly, yeah. but he keeps winning yeah. and great football teams. You know, the Super Bowl is often boring because they're just really good defensive teams and nothing much happens because right. That's probably what he got there is they didn't score on you very much, you know? So, um, I feel like, you know, does this apply to startups? It's something I want to think about. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely think it's true about things like markets and customers. We're like so many people build stuff that just isn't right. It's it's a blunder. <laughs> okay, it's a yeah. blunder to do this. So, you know, is to me like the the whole thing about a large and growing market. You could just say just don't blunder the market. If it's large and growing market. Is it the best? Is it perfect? I don't know. But you didn't blunder it. You didn't just pick a terrible market. You didn't blunder the market. So that's pretty good already. Um, you know, can you get some people to say yes? Or, or you know, if, if enough people say no, you know, don't do that. That's a blunder, you know? And so uh, is this is this a fully formed idea? Is it really right? I don't really know. Hey, you I, poke you so know? many holes in it because with chess, it's like, okay, someone eats your queen on move one. It's yeah. like, eh, it's probably somewhat of a blunder. We all know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, I don't know, like Elon Musk coming out with a cyber truck and people would be like, this is going to flop. But then it doesn't. And you're like, well, that wasn't a blunder. So is my thesis correct? Well, I mean, or, or the iPhone. I think the iPhone coming out, everyone was like, this is exciting, but it doesn't have a keyboard. It looks stupid. Apple's uh, never made a phone. When the iPhone came out, we were all very, very excited. We were very excited, but a lot, I think a lot of people were like, but will this like last? No, no, no. It was like magic just happened. Yeah. I was excited too. <laughs> um, but also I do, I do remember, like, it's hard to think now, so but some I'm, people I'm thought try, I'm trying to think even more basic. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I think when you have a completely revolutionary product, that's just a whole nother kind of it's thing. It's a one of one, yeah. What, what I'm, what I'm talking about is like, um, and again, this might be a bad idea just to be clear, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but since, but since you brought, you kind of brought this up of like, I, I think, I do think there's things that are like clear blunders. Like that's, there's like clearly there's a market for smartphones. The question is, is this the right phone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that like that the market wasn't a blunder for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, so and if you ever tried a f iPhone at the time, it was like, oh my god. 
and yeah, it didn't have copy paste. Like there's all these things. It was like, that's the internet though. Mm -hmm. It's the internet. Like it was absolutely magical. Mm -hmm. Um, and the sales launched, like the sales just absolutely took off. Like there was just no question that <laughs> this is a huge hit. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I'm, I'm just talking about something very much more basic of just like, you didn't even talk to customers first. Mm -hmm. So you, you just totally blundered that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's like an 80% chance you'll fail because you just didn't ask the people that might buy. So that's true. Yeah, probably they won't. I don't know, but you could have prevented that. Like you did that. You, you lost your queen on that one. Right. So like pick a market that's not crap, talk to customers and, and find something where they don't wholly reject it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, solve a problem that, that, that does exist. Like, there's just like these things of like, none of these guarantee success or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But if you can just eliminate the totally negative versions of this, are you, are you sort of like halfway home in a sense? So I don't know, maybe not, maybe it's a bad yeah. idea, but it's like, it's interesting thing to think about because it, it generates brand new questions. How would I do this completely wrong? I would pick a tiny market with no money happening that no one knows about that's shrinking. And there's already the incumbent who owns the whole market anyway, and everyone's happy with them. Mm -hmm. That's what I would pick. Yeah. Okay. So if, if the market has even some attributes like that, probably a bad market, you just described a bad market. Now you can identify a bad market. Even if you can't identify a good one, you just, you can easily identify a bad one. So maybe don't blunder the market. Um, again, like, how, uh, how would you validate with customers? You just wouldn't. You'd let yeah. the dice, you'd throw the dice. <laughs> it's like, we'll let them roll. As the, it's like, what? No. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, and, you know, and so forth. So like, uh, I think it might be like this angle to find, it's easier to think of a really dumb way to do that part of this, that step of the process, you know? And so, okay, well, don't do anything near that dumb way. <laughs> like, be far away from the dumb. And maybe you're halfway home already. That's that's a that's a great way to put it. What, that last part of let, yeah, go into a small market. That's a blunder. That that makes a lot of sense. Uh, lastly, course, I say that yeah, you're gonna find an example of a startup that went into a tiny shrinking market and did really well. Yeah, I'm sure you someone's like, well, Microsoft invented no, software. You, you will, you yeah, will. exactly. Like, once again, as always, no laws, no laws. You can. It's not the law of conservation of energy that you really can't violate. Yeah. <laughs> None of these are laws. To me, every one of them is. Can I stack the deck in my favor? Mm -hmm. Can I just take some of the risk out? Mm -hmm because there's risk everywhere and it multiplies like however risky the market is that it will or won't work it's multiplied by whether the competitors will beat you multiplied by whether you can even execute this multiplied by whether the, whether customers will really pay that amount multiplied by whether in five years it's still relevant multiply mm -hmm. multiplied not add so it just goes down to zero right mm -hmm. and and most companies don't work See, because <laughs> multiply. So to me, it's like none of these go to 100% and there's no laws about that, period. But if you can take this from, and, and, and I, you, of course, you don't really know the numbers. So this is, this is just for fun. But like, um, well, if you can take that from a 30% chance to a 50% chance and the next one from a 10% chance to a 30% chance, mm -hmm. like it's still unlikely. But if you can get it from 10 to 30, that's actually three times as likely. Mm -hmm. So if you can, can you adjust these things? in the direction of um, being less risky or better for you. You know, again, a lot of, like we said at the top, it could be about you. For you, if you do this, it's less risky because you're great at this. For someone else, that would be really bad because they're not as good at it. So it's about you yeah. <laughs> and your partner. And so if that's true, then this idea of not blundering actually makes a lot of sense because it's not like this means the market, this means it, it's great and it'll definitely work. That's not what it means. Mm -hmm. And of course you could go the other way and it still work. Of course. It's about like, but overall, is this going to increase the chance that it works? Mm -hmm. So my claim is, yeah, I think so. I don't even have data to give you about it. I'm just saying, I think so. <laughs> I think it's an interesting idea, probably. So if you can raise all of these a little, and as it multiplies through, you've actually drastically increased the probability of success. So again, I don't have any data about this. It's just a rhetorical case. But if you are like, that makes sense to me, that's like, great. Well, then it gives you something actionable to do, mm -hmm. which is to think about the really bad blunder case and say, I got to stay away from that. Like what's far away from that? If it, if I smell some of that, yeah, I'll know. Ooh, right. <laughs> and that's, that's handy. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, uh, you've started two unicorn companies. I'm sure you've been around a lot of people with like uh, what most people call like extreme levels of wealth. Um, where do you see people are the most fulfilled at that level? Once, once you're, uh, I heard a great term from Bology called post-economic where you're just like, you have enough money where you never have to work again. Um, 
What do you see people get a lot of fulfillment out of? For you, I would call you, I would classify you as an endearing nerd. And nerds are usually, like, tech yeah. is always new. Yeah. So there's always something fun for them to work on. I met a Darmesh HubSpot CEO. Yeah. I'd say he's an endearing nerd where yep. he gets so excited about, oh, my God, you see what OpenAI did? I hired a developer and we're program. I'm like, that guy's having fun. Exactly. And I don't think he cares about all the other things that he could buy. That's He definitely does part. not care about that. He does. No, you could look at how he dresses. No offense. But yeah, well, we're, he we're doesn't friends. care. He, was, he invested in WP Engine. Like, we're, yeah, I can tell you for sure he doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could see that. But those seem like, to me, from what I've observed, the happiest people. Like they have something to work on and something that they're still striving towards. Yeah, certainly fulfilled has a purpose, even if it's an internal one, you know. So I think one is an internal one like that. You just you you are driven by something. And so that that's mm -hmm. enough. Um, another kind has an external purpose. You see it sometimes with people who are very religious. And so what it does is it allows them to like fully live in that space mm -hmm. and do whatever they want to do in that space. Um, uh, or just other causes that they get involved with. Obviously, Bill Gates, right, who I don't know, of course, but, yeah. <laughs> like, but obviously like, you know, certain causes he, he, he found interesting and, and, and interesting intellectually to tackle and very impactful to millions, if not billions of people. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's a, that's a, that is something too. Um, I think some people find um, teaching to be a way to kind of be, to pay it forward, have some ego still, you mm -hmm. know, like, oh, you're the person in the front of the room teaching um, and pay forward that expertise while still keeping some of the ego and, and, uh, and, and all that. That's also a, a place I see myself. Mm. Like that's what I'm doing online. Mm. And when I, you know, I've invested in dozens of startups and I love having the lunches or the Zooms where we talk about the whatever. And, yeah. you know, because again, it's this thing where um, I can leverage all these years of experience and thoughts and stuff to just give them ideas or bang around advice or talk about different things that have happened. I think the last thing you want to do is try to tell someone what to do. But what you can do is say, oh, you know, you might not be thinking about this possibility. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, oh, there's, you know, you're thinking, you're trying to just, you see this one option and you hate it. Mm -hmm. We can discuss like three other options. I'm not going to tell you which one to pick, but we can, but you don't even know they exist. And then we can try to talk through some of the, uh, the trade-offs. And now you're, now you're in a better place to decide. You still have to decide, right? But yeah. I can really help here. Or, or sometimes there's something operational, like if someone's selling their business, there's just a lot of stuff. And if you've never done it before, there's just a lot of stuff you haven't seen and done. Okay. So th there's a little bit more like, oh, you know generally this, generally that, you should do this. And you know, that's just helpful. So that's all very edifying to me hmm. to be able to pay it like forward like that. Um, but generally I would say the rich are not fulfilled, not happy. Um, you know, many of them don't have a good family life. Maybe many of them have kids that they don't see. Mm -hmm. um, many of them don't figure out something that's fulfilling to do. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of lost. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the majority of the case when this happens, people get money and then they leave the company. Mm -hmm. The majority of the time they get depressed. And it's it's actually like postpartum depression specifically. Hmm. Um, a, a loss of identity and self. And, and you know, for, for a similar kind of reason. Um, there are studies on this, which is why I say most. Mm -hmm. like the, now I'm using these words because there are, there is data on this. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, if people are interested in this, there's one that's, that's really well written by Credit Suisse. Um, and I forget, unfortunately what it's called, but it's, it's something like the entrepreneurial life or life. Oh, life after exit. I think it's called hmm. something like that. Um, that one is like something like 20 or 30 entrepreneurs. So not like massive N, but very deep on each one, like, like, like profiles and, and deep, deeply following each one. So while N isn't big, it's big enough that if you see like, okay, but all but five had this happen. It's like, that's pretty clear, right? <laughs> you, know, like yeah. like, you know, you don't need more end to know that that's a real effect. Yeah. Um, so probably it's not going to feel good emotionally. And then the question is, are you going to find the next thing or not? And a lot of people do not. Mm -hmm. Now, of course you could say, well, boo hoo, the ultra rich are unhappy. Yeah. Too bad. And that's fine. I, I, I accept that too. Um, but you ask what it's like and, and, uh, that, that is often what it is like. You, you can, you can care and be empathetic or not care as you wish, <laughs> but that is what, that is often what it is like. Well, I, I, there's another, uh, 
analog Seinfeld after he created Seinfeld, which is obviously this worldwide phenomenon that like, of course, is talent, but then also a fair bit of luck in the right moment, right time and right period of history, right cast that all happened. And he's just like, there's no way I'm ever going to surpass that. Like, that's just like naive to think. Um, however, he's just like the good part about him was he always was a road comic. Yeah. That's and what he loves. He, he said, he said this great quote where he's just like, I love the long slog Sha Shawshank Redemption slog through the sewage pipe of going to a place waiting backstage, doing my routine, getting on a plane. He's like, that's what I loved since the day one. And that's what I still do now, even though I don't need to. Exactly. That, thinking, that, like, that's, that's what I mean way. about that inner drive. Like yeah. you said during mesh, you know, like, so that's great. If you have that, you just get to do exactly that. Yeah. Um, however much money it does or doesn't make, who cares? And so that's great. If you have that, that's great. Um, it's interesting that so many people don't, or the fire goes out anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is that thing about it won't ever be this good. I think some people don't recover from that. Um, I was just seeing this interview with Gary Kasparov, who is probably the best chess player ever, if not number two, for sure. And um, when he won, he, he he like first beat Karpov to become number one. I forget if it was like the 80, 1980 or something like that. And Karpov was at the time considered to be one of the best ever. So this was a huge, huge achievement. And someone came up to him at the ceremony and said, I'm sorry for you because the best day of your life is now in the past. Oof. And so that's a, I mean, for anybody rich or not, <laughs> that's a, that's a powerful statement. And then you, you got to feel like just, just definitionally, there will be a best day. Mm-hmm. Now, it could be the last day of your life too, I guess, but probably not. <laughs> Just right. And, uh, but it could be. So, what do you do with that? And so, you could do different things. You could say, I'm going to try to design my life so that the last day is the best day. And I'm going to try to figure out what that even means. What would that mean? Is it about people? Because it's not about health, <laughs> right? <laughs> but is it, what, is it about meaning and purpose and people? And blah, blah, blah. or, or, um, or you could say, no, it's not, that isn't the case, but I'll have chapters in my life. And so that'll happen and that will be the end of that chapter and I'll have a different chapter. And you might say best in one definition, but then maybe I define what it is that I even want. Mm -hmm. Might have a different best by a different definition or just reject this whole concept and just say it's a different yeah. chapter. And so it's just, you know, different chapter. that'd be another way to handle that in a way that's like constructive and forward looking. Um, but I feel like it's hard to do that. And maybe, and, and is there another chapter? Like, it's hard to say. Well, you, you know what? Here's a, here's an interesting parallel. I was an Eagle Scout and we had to do this like long hike. And for seven days, I was carrying like 80 pounds on my back. I weighed about 120 at the time. <laughs> and like, I cried on that trip. I hated, I hated a lot of it. But when you got back, I hadn't sat down on a chair for seven days. <laughs> and like my butt was just like hurting from walking all the time, wet, and then also just sitting on rocks all day, like sharp, pointy <laughs> rocks. And I sat down on a camp chair and got a cold Dr. Pepper from uh, from the vending machine. And I specifically be that that is one of the top memories of my entire life. Right. Okay. When I was in like, I don't know, 10th grade or something like that. And I just remember thinking, I'm just like, I have had a Dr. Pepper before that time. I have sat on many chairs, but for some reason that was that and it was followed by this intense period of like not having that of deprivation yeah that created that good time yeah, yeah, yeah and so i also think someone like elon musk he gets very rich and and you know post-economic at a very young age and for a very smart driven person he's just like well this would be horrible if this is all i was going to do and so i think he keeps upping the stakes to give himself something to do yeah i mean and maybe so i can't i certainly can't speak for him I would say certainly in life, we have these crucible moments, like you're saying, where you just went through something and some people say you learned something about yourself. You might've, but you certainly learned that you can push yourself and that you're capable of things. And like, mm -hmm. you certainly have this feeling of like the next hard thing. I'm going to say like, well, yeah, but I can do hard things. And so I feel like that's a, that's an important moment for people to have. Um, I think the difference with some of these things is this, you did not feel like, uh, what you are in life is a hiker and that you will never hike better than this. Fair point. It was a, it was an crucible moment, which is again, extremely great. Mm -hmm. I think with Kasparov, he never did anything but chess ever. Like when you're in that level, and this is still true today of, of everyone who plays chess at that level, you don't go to university. You don't have normal school. Many are homeschooled so they can play chess more. You don't do anything else but chess. Mm -hmm. You aren't anything else but chess. You're not good at anything but chess. Mm -hmm. And so if you achieve something, 
there isn't something else. It's not like, well, obviously I'm a human being that's going to do other things. I just went on a long hike. You know, it's like, no, 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 this is actually it. Mm. And it's just, it's much more like, well, I'll just do the next thing. It's totally unclear there'll be a next thing. And I guarantee you it won't be the number one at something because mm-hmm. that's too, that's too good. You know, mm-hmm. it's too <laughs> epic. Um, another example would be like, uh, um, and I, I, I have a piece where I wrote about this particular thing because I've written about this and how it's why the journey is important. Mm-hmm. This is why the journey is important because the end happens in, in, in a day and after that it might even be bad. Mm. So the journey is where the fun part is, where the excitement is, where the, like, I mean, not that it's the only place, but like you had better enjoy the journey. Mm-hmm. You had better make that part of the point because the pinnacle is absolutely not the point. Mm-hmm. This is what this is demonstrating. Anyway, an example I gave there is um, everyone thought that the Pesh mode, the, the band, you know, they, right? Familiar? I saw them recently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did too when they came to Austin. Um, they, uh, everyone... They, 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 so this was before bands were selling out um, stadiums and huge arenas like that. And they got the Rose Bowl, which is for people that don't know, it's like 80 or 90,000 seats. Like it's absolutely insane. And so the music world is all like, this is going to be embarrassing. Like they're going to have rented this huge stadium and you're going to have to like put seats away. And I don't know, it's going to be like a tiny little thing in a huge echoey place. Um, and they saw, thought so too. And they were worried, like, what do we do? Can we like put curtains? Like there was, it was bad. They ended up selling out the whole place. Mm-hmm. And there's a live album that you can get from that, which is, of course, this incredible. It's incredible. You can just tell it's electric. Um, there's also a documentary about them, by the way, which has this. Hmm. And at the end of it, they're backstage. You can see this in the documentary as well. And they just all start crying. And part of it is just the emotional release of just everything that just happened, you know. But also there was a there was a. Um, I forget the name of the person, but it was a, a music journalist that was there, you know, mm-hmm. and again, there was a crew and he asked them and they're just like, it's, it can't be better than this. Like, this is it. Mm-hmm. We, we sold out the biggest thing and everyone said we couldn't like, it just, it doesn't get bigger than that. I mean, it could get bigger, like more people could buy the out, you know, but like this, it will never be as big as this. Mm-hmm. And they just realized this is it. But this is a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's not like that was the end of the band, obviously. But it's just this, this moment. So I feel like um, if this is all that you are, this is you've poured everything that you are for as long as you can remember. <laughs> and that's it. It's like, what the hell? And so for 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 people that, you know, they've worked on their companies for 15 years and they sell it. You know, is it exactly like that? I don't know. Like probably there is a second chapter or hopefully there is, but like that's how that can feel. Mm-hmm. That's part of why it's just so like depressing and I don't know, you know. Now, again, you can do a lot with that information. You could say, well, shit, I never I never want to be in that situation. So I'm not going to work on something for 15 years where I'm not going to tie my identity into it. I'm going to keep it at arm's length mm-hmm. so that it doesn't feel that way because it won't be that way. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, or maybe I'll. I'll leave either either by handing it off or selling it or duh, 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 selling my share, duh, duh, you know, so, so that I'm never kind of in that spot. I'm always I'm always doing stuff. Not that I'm like aloof and never care about anything. And never, not that, but just I'm never going to let it build to this point where this is all and every. I'm just not going to let that happen. I'm going to choose a different path. You could do that with that information. You could say I'm going to do that, but then I'm going to realize there's another chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, Kasparov went on to do other interesting things. He was a big political. A mover because he left the Soviet Union. Yeah. There was other things that he did, and sure, he's not going to be the he's not going to be number one, quote unquote, like in chess. But it doesn't mean he can't have a massive impact. And by the way, parlay his fame into real impact that he himself could never have had had he yeah. not first had that fame. Aha! Uh-huh. So like that's not the same thing as like. And now he's a gold medalist in the luge. Like no, <laughs> not that kind that's of the one sport you might be able to actually win. <laughs> yeah, like no, he's not going to do that kind of a thing. But he could parlay into a different kind of a thing that only he could do, given that fame, given that experience, given you know. Then maybe there's something that only he can do based on that. Interesting. So there's a lot of ways you could kind of take that and and decide what does that mean for you and whether you want to avoid it or not avoid it. But I do think it's worth thinking about because otherwise it just happens anyway. Yeah. So that doesn't seem like a good choice. Maybe if you're lucky enough, it could happen. Because I, but that's, this is why I yeah. like the endearing nerd. I think like John Carmack, Stephen Wolfram, these are people that I think like you just put them in a cave and oh, they'd yeah. be perfectly happy right. the rest of their life, just like reading about stuff, mm-hmm. figuring out stuff. Mm-hmm. So something I always aspire to be. Some of my most happy moments I remember in college were like drinking a coffee at 4 a.m. Uh, and I was a computer science student my first year and like working on code 
in a coffee shop that was empty at, by myself. And I remember thinking like, that was really fun. Or I remember writing late at night in a WeWork and, and like they turned the lights off and I'm like, <laughs> well, I don't know how to turn them on. So I'll just keep going. And I always remember like, that's what I really liked doing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Anyways, great conversation. How can people uh, find you? I am, a, uh, yeah, I'm a smart bear.com and the same thing on Twitter. Jason Cohen, WP Engine.